Welcome to another episode of Journeys in Entrepreneurship. Today we have Alhaji M. D. Abubakar. Alhaji Abubakar is a former banker with over a decade experience in development and commercial banking. He switched from banking to starting L and Z Integrated Farms in 1997. He started L and Z from cattle rearing business to expanding its offerings to the entire dairy value chain from production all the way to marketing. L and Z produces fresh milk, yogurt, fura de nono, ice cream, and chicken. The business delivers their products to many stores, including ShopRite and other supermarkets across Nigeria. Interviewing him is Faith Foundation Scale Up Lab for alumni, Princess Adeinka Tekena. Princess Adeinka is the founder of one of Nigeria's premier indigenous coffee franchises, Happy Coffee. Happy Coffee's brand is on a mission to give happiness in every cup by delivering a liberating coffee experience through their freshly roasted, wholly and locally grown Nigerian coffee beans. Join us as we listen to their journeys in entrepreneurship in the agribusiness space. Today, our focus will be on the agri sector in Nigeria. My name is Princess Ade Inkatekena. I am the founder of Happy Coffee, and our focal entrepreneur today is MD Abubakar, who is the CEO of L and Z Integrated Farms, and most importantly, he is the current president of the Commercial Dairy Ranchers Association of Nigeria. It's great to have you on set today, sir. My pleasure, Princess. Oh wow, it's such a privilege knowing everything that you've done in the sector. We like to just understand your journey. So first, I like to usually ask. What, insp what inspired you on this journey and what still inspires you? Thank you very much. Um, it all started with a dream, as usual. And uh, I loved animals and I wanted to retire into animal herding or animal husbandry. And um, so it started as a passion. I was in a bank. And um, I started my banking career in Lagos, and I was posted to Kano as a branch manager for Commercial Bank. Um, so it was there I decided that, okay, probably I may not leave Kano without starting something that will ultimately culminate into my dream, which was uh, animal husbandry. And I was particularly more interested in cow uh, um, cow raising, if you like. And uh, as a young bank manager, I had all the privileges of what young people uh, were looking forward to. Uh, but I knew that for me to get to get into what I really wanted to, I had to, at the time, put a stop to those um, fine life engagement like banking uh, then you're now trying to transit into farm which is dirty completely opposite of what obtained at that time so uh, but I had took the decision and at a pretty young age just in my 30s uh, and uh, so you can imagine me to retire from uh, receiving salary or to stop the receiving salary at the age of 31 32 and start paying salary at the age of 33 it was by no means a Herculean tax but i was willing to go deep into it and i didn't look back and i think as they said the rest is history so this in a nutshell is how it all started from bank to farm wow so those are two extreme poles banking and farming and um, what i really loved about what you said is you started with a dream um, I think dreaming is part of what you know inspires a lot of entrepreneurs. But when you look at the entire value chain when it comes to milk, um, I like to you know just get a view of how it was when you started and what the industry looks like today, um, what the progressions have been, the developments. I know that your company have I've read about your profile. You, your company has done a lot of work in helping to structure the milk industry in Nigeria. But I'd like to just and the audience would like to hear how the milk industry was when you got into uh, you know, the industry and sector as a whole and what it is today. Yeah, so uh, beautiful question. Actually, when 
I started dairy farming, the the cost was not clear for me. I didn't even know what it was. I just thought, okay, you raise a cow, you milk and sell. It was um, much later when I got to a point that I had exhausted the animals I had on my farm. I started collecting milk from commercial dairy farmers around me. And then uh, I exhausted that as well because the demand was growing and I couldn't meet the market demand. Then I said, okay, I need to go further. And that's when I established the outgrower scheme where I now organized the herdsmen into cooperatives and then establishment collection centers and then going every morning to evacuate the milk. So now I had, I had scaled up and I had the volume. It's now we've exhausted the markets. Now we were in seller's market. Now we were in buyer's market, if you like. Uh, so the challenge now was very clear to me that I could not compete with cheaper imports. I did a record with that when I was going into the business. It was at that moment I had abandoned everything. I had invested all my savings and I didn't even go for loan as at that time. I was just trying to see how I could do with locally manufactured equipment. And it, when I started now hitting the market, I realized that most of the yogurt I'm competing with get the, the they reconstitute uh, fat filled milk and get into the same market with me and they could afford to sell very cheap. And I realized my cost of producing a liter of milk in the farm is much higher than the selling price of this yogurt. So I was like, how could I move forward? Uh, I didn't relent. I just said, okay, let me just create a brand that I will let as much as possible people know that, okay, you can buy a quality and uh, there are yogurts and there are yogurts and I want to stand out. And, and, and that was the push. And uh, my family, that's my spouses, were, were really very supportive because they were the first victim of my decision. And uh, from bank to farm, the, the, the good life suddenly stopped and, so, and, and we started struggling all over again. Um, so falling up, standing, going back again was, was the whole story. But coming back to the actual happenings, as I said, the market was very clear to me that I could not compete with cheaper imports and I could not com That's when I started Fresh Milk, I realized there are a lot of, um, of long life milk that could stay six months. Mine had only 10 days shelf life. Uh, yogurt, you could have a lot of reconstituted fat filled milk made yogurt in the market that are much cheaper. Um, so I, I, I knew for me to make any headway and even to the, the support I'm getting from commercial dairy farmers that are giving me milk, for that to be sustainable, something just has to be done about the industry. And I realized there was no even an association that I could join for us to have a voice to, to, to make noise about what was happening. So, I, so you, apart from taking care of my factory, then I have a challenge of seeing how we make the industry profitable to 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 make others even come and join because the more the merrier only me could not have could not have turned around the an entire industry dominated by multinationals uh, so i i reached out to few others that were like me and 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 we had a had to have discussion and we realized we were facing the same problem and we said okay this is our country for god's sake and uh, we visited some countries in Kenya, we went to Kenya, India, and we saw how it was done. It was not a, it was not an issue of two liter producing cow, no. Um, and whenever we got into discussion, you will hear that cows, your cows there cannot produce much volume, so that's why we we could not. But it's not true. I realized that two two liters aggregated could give the the required volume, and this is what is happening in Kenya and India. And I said, no, please, that narrative must stop, and let's look forward. And, we came together as, an, as, as individuals, businesses, and formed this association, Commercial Dairy Ranchers Association, to fight for the right of uh, local dairy producers in the country. And uh, I think we've made a lot of progress. We've been able to 
uh, have the support of the ministries to come together and we've had even reviewed and come up with a policy uh, framework and policy discussion took place and is validation that we're waiting for now. So, and this did not happen in a year two. It's a 20 year journey, I must tell you. And um, having achieved this in this direction, so you can see when we started as a Lone Ranger um, against today, with a lot of people coming together and the, and, 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 and then there's, there's even um, awareness by both citizenry and government alike and the policies were, were, were brought about to, to force multinationals to backward integrate. So we will see, I, at the risk of sounding immodest, that I was instrumental to all this backward integration and other things that were happening in the daily when we started. We made a lot of noise. We realized that we could not continue this way. And then, then um, uh, other multinationals that were only important and dumping now so reason and then the writing was clearly on the wall that that something had to happen and when the backward integration inter uh, backward integration um uh, intervention by cbn came wasn't a surprise it wasn't a surprise to me that most a lot of multinationals are now going back to do what i had been doing for the last 20 years uh, so it's 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 the, the scape has the scope is the, the landscape has changed actually, uh, and and it's better now than how it was. I took a risk, and um, I, I I I didn't regret. It was uh, loss, 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 break even, break even, then suddenly profit. So now, if you're going into the business, it's very likely that you start your 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 break even point is much closer than when when I started, and then profitability is equally much closer and the volume much higher. Because now I know that uh, a liter of milk, cost of producing a liter of milk is not is not higher than the price of a liter of milk that is imported. When we started, cost of producing milk is half is is double the price of imported milk in the country. So things have completely changed, and opportunities for making money is there, and uh, and, and 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 you don't have to start at the age of thirty. You can still stay a little longer in the industry, but um, you have to do it when you are strong enough. At our age, it should be consolidation, not more investment or, or what do I do. It's consolidating what you have achieved to see that you expand and probably uh, meet the uh, expanded demand that the awareness of your brand has created. So I think uh, I, my advice to you is Take the bull by the, it doesn't have to be ready. Any any agri business, you have to you have to just uh, decide, take a decision against all odds, and just dive into it. Um, uh, that's the first thing. Uh, sometimes you may know the risk, and then probably mitigate before you go. Sometimes, as a young man, you are, you should be a risk taker for God's sake. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, when you get in there, then you'll, you'll, you'll find, yeah, you'll find a way to stay in a flood. Uh, but I can tell you, agribusiness uh, has never been better than now in all its ramification. And uh, the, the landscape is getting better and better. And so I think the difference between when we started and now, the difference is just it pulls apart. That's fantastic. I think one of the things I would also like to know, a lot of, I know they know L and Z, but we'd like to also hear about all the products that you create with your farm, because um, some of our viewers might not even know, they might not even have seen any of our products, but we'd like to know what kind of products, is it just fresh milk? I know you have yogurt, what other kind of services does the farm produce? And then we'll also go into value chain addition um, um, projects that you're doing, that you have done. Just see a rounded picture of how far you've come in this thing. I mean, 20 years is a long time. Yeah, sure. Uh, when we started, actually, we, we were only into fresh milk. I must tell you, because it's easy. You just extract the milk from the cow, and then you just pasteurized. And here you have your pasteurized fresh milk, and you just go into the market. It's, the value addition is less, and uh, it's, it's easy to do. But the challenge then was the shelf life and the, and the, the due to its perishability, 
uh, handling particularly the culture and infrastructure that was not there and is still not available. So um, what happened, we actually sat down and decided to explore the entire value chain from production to processing to marketing. So we're involved in the entire value chain. So production, when we started, was only our farm. We expanded our source of milk from our own farm to commercial dairy farmers around and then extended to pastoralists. So you see three folds and that's only the production side. Then we now bring the milk to our own facility. That's why we process. So that's the processing side. So we process. Now this is the differentiation you're talking about. Uh, we started with fresh milk, but we realized that fresh milk has shorter lifespan. Yogurt had longer lifespan. And the culture of fresh milk is not even there in the country. People are more used to powdered milk and evaporated milk, and at worst, UHT, the long, the life long, the, the long life uh, tetra packed milk. So um, we find it difficult to penetrate the market with a new product that people are not aware or are not used to. Uh, the test buds over time had been abused, if you like, by this product. So it was a Herculean tax for us, and we now saw that fermented milk product market is really really good so then we went into yogurt production and then yogurt became our number one product but uh, there is this uh fura de nono this is a local delicacy known in but it's now a nigerian delicacy so we equally uh started producing fura de nono and it's also uh, accepted now it's 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 in it's part of our SKUs and uh, we do ice cream as well yeah well, we, we remove the cream when we because we have low fat yogurt we have low fat milk so we need to remove the cream so the cream now we we, we wanted to do butter but things happened and that made us to stop butter then we now say okay what do we do with the cream since we have the machine to separate the milk to the cream from the milk then we go we went into ice cream production but ice cream production came up with a lot of additives that turned it into ice cream outside the cream so uh we 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 collaborate with some ice cream um companies that import um ice cream powder and then uh, we, we we mix in a certain ratio just to make sure that all those additives are, that that are done properly elsewhere come bring, we, we bring in and then we mix our own cream and we produce ice cream so that's where we get our cream engaged in so um then um we also started uh producing local chicken this is an area that we we realized that there's no producer all you have is frozen chicken so we decided to go into local chicken because we were doing poultry at the time, uh, but we stopped due to bird flu events. We've had several, we stopped. So when we now started collecting milk from the pastoralists, we organized them into cooperatives. One thing we realized was happening is the small girls that were used in hawking milk were no longer doing anything. The women that used to go to town to hawk milk were no longer doing anything. And uh, we now say, okay, look, uh, the girls, we should have an arrangement where you send them to school. We can make some arrangement to pay for the school fees. This we have done. We started with a premium on the liter of milk we collect from a family that sent a girl child to school. And then it, it went beyond that, involved even the boys. And uh, we had to have a fund that we worked towards improving to make sure that we had ready-made money. To, to support that yeah to support that activity uh so now we are left with the woman what do we do with her we say okay look uh, you just milk the you, you just milk the cow in the morning and then you're doing nothing so why don't you rear chicken and another thing is the nutritious challenge because if we now collect all the milk that they take as a family and a growing child uh to improve or to, or to, to to get their protein nutrient so where do they fall back for their new, new for their protein so 
chicken rearing was alternative to us. We say, okay, we give you. So what we do is we have hatchery supported by a development partner and we have parent stock of local chicken. So we have the egg, we hatch, then we take the chicks to these women and we tell them, okay, here you are. For instance, take 10 chicks, rear them, you bring back it, we buy it from you and then slaughter two and eat. So this is how we brought about chicken. So that's why we have local chicken now as part of our products. So we have yogurt, fresh milk, ice cream, local chicken, fried and no, no. And then uh, Greek yogurt is on its way. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is, I see the Nigerians are, are keen. Yeah, yeah, Greek yogurt. Um, thank you so much. You've done a lot of expanding in terms of your product. There are many questions we would like to ask, especially for a young entrepreneur like myself. I remember when I got into the coffee journey, there wasn't any framework. Um, this was about six years ago. You've done a lot of work in creating framework for the milk industry. But I want to also hear your understanding of the role of government in creating structures for businesses. Because for a lot of us who are young in our businesses, trying our best to stay afloat, we understand that there's a role of government. I remember after COVID, a lot of young businesses had a lot of difficult time being able to get um, working capital to get their business back on track. So a lot of businesses thought the government should have supported us financially in terms of giving us some cushions. Because when you watch the news, you see what the American government was doing. The British government was giving you know, support funding to businesses. A lot of young entrepreneurs didn't get that support, even though the government said they were going to. However, I want to hear your understanding of what the role of government is. Should government have helped us? Um, is government just for policy, security? As, a, as an entrepreneur that is seasoned, what, do you, what is the role of government in building enterprise? Yeah. First thing I would say that government has no business being in business. So um, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't subscribe to the fact that government should come and buy shares in your company, no, far from it. Uh, what government should do is create an enabling environment for you to prosper. Now the challenge is for you to do the right thing. That's just the truth. Uh, but funding, yes. You know, um, we have to understand all sorts of, we have to understand the funding structure in the first place. You don't take a working capital overdraft and fund a long-term investment or, what, or fund an item or project cost that's supposed to be financed by equity and you use the working capital. There's a mismatch and you've killed the business up an issue. So young people have to understand that they need to they, they need to engage experts to come up with a feasibility study that is bankable. And it's simple, establishing the technical feasibility of any project you want to go into. What is the financial viability of that project? And then the economic desirability, which brings about the macro and micro. This the macro is government concern. Is it going to create jobs? Is it going to bring about foreign exchange savings? Is it going to bring about technology transfer? These are the considerations that you in your head should be able to answer before you even venture into such a business. And if the risk is too high, mitigate it up in issue. And thank God government has done um, sometimes some things. For instance, if a risk, if, a, if a, an agribusiness is, is, is risky, and it's because of its risk is that finances, you're not getting financing from financial bank. You have NASA to take the risk off the banks. And then you have intervention by CBN that is single digit interest, the commercial agri-credit scheme and some others. You have to take advantage of that. And then you have, you in the COVID era, I know the CBN, I don't know if it has reversed, I don't think it has. They have reduced the single digit from 9% to 5%. So now the interest is 5%. So you need to access such intervention loan. And uh, when you talk of equity, I know funds for Africa finance in Nigeria, which we are the first investee, and it's still there. The only thing is once you get involved with Fafin, then it's actually managed by Sahel Capital in Lagos. They will take about certain percentage of your equity, but they will get involved in your business. You need to have a good corporate governance. You need to have a good management structure. You need to be up to date in your statutory, ob statutory obligation. You cannot evade or avoid tasks. You have to do the right thing. So people have to understand that when you, when you, and the essence of this intervention by Fafin is to take you, it, it, it's to exist after five years. 
I'm happy to tell you that they are about exiting from my investment now. We've already reached the five years and they met us at, um, we have quadrupled our, our size in the last five years and, and we're happy for what has happened. So if they come in, by the time they are getting in, you should be structured enough that any due diligence done on you should come out clean that you are ready for any foreign investor. So you need to understand this and you have to be ready. So there are equity financing with even uh, opportunity of restructuring your company and having experts to be and they can access a lot of support for you in the course of their stay these five years. So this I don't know other equity opportunities, but I know this for sure. Then there is long term loan opportunity through CACs, through CBN intervention. Then there are 1,001 banks in the country that can provide you working capital through overdraft. So this we've enjoyed severally and we are still enjoying. And we've, we've as difficult our, as our business is, we're still happy. We make money for ourselves and we make money for the lenders and the investors as well. So this, we have to have a, we have to have a, a paradigm shift of thought if you like that is you cannot invest today and make millions tomorrow patience is very important it's very key two you have to do the right thing and doing the right thing means you cannot afford o and b when you start your business the very first day you cannot you, you can do that at a least that from your earnings but certainly not from your capital yeah. by the time you don't separate your pocket from your invest from your business then you're in big trouble yeah. so this culture needs to be imbibed by our young people then it's it's, it's don't see lnz today and think that you just go to get into what lnz is doing and you'll be a competitor tomorrow unless you have extremely deep pockets yeah. otherwise you need to grow like us and i told you it's a 20-year journey yeah. it, it doesn't come easy after all cows get pregnant and stay nine months just like you so we wow. started when my beard was black <laughs> now your, your beards are full of great, great. wisdom <laughs> i'll not call it gray hair i'll call it great wisdom thank you thank you for bringing that very critically um knowing that we're on a journey um, that also helps entrepreneurs know that we're on a long journey but that journey is doable based on the fact that looking at where you started your business from where it is today well, you said something also very critical. As young business owners, we need to do the right thing. We need to put structures in place and very key. However, I would also like to hear, I know we've talked about a lot of serious things. You said you started in your 30s, you were a banker. I think some people would like to hear how that journey transited from banking to becoming the largest milk producer, fresh milk producer in Nigeria. I want to hear some fun parts. Uh, yesterday when I was talking to you, I heard stories of you on Moluwe. I mean, those are stories that young people need to hear. Um, you didn't fall from the sky. You didn't get any inheritance. You literally built this business on your back. We would like to hear those stories. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. The, on the, uh, the the fun side, yeah, I was telling you yesterday that we started. You see, I served in Lagos. Uh, that That's what took me to Lagos, NYC. And then from there, I... Fortunately for me, I served with Nigeria Industrial Development Bank, and that's where. And I, I served in what we call project resuscitation department, where all collapsed projects were taken to, and you are given the mandate to revive those projects. So, as a copper, I what the first thing I knew as a working career is how businesses were collapsing. So, so and and you had you are working to refi, to revive those businesses. So this helped a lot in bringing the entrepreneurship ideas into me. I, I, I knew as a copper that major problem of, work, of businesses were working capital, lack of working capital, lack of good management, and then probably bad, bad structure. These, these are the only three things. So you need to guide against that one. Then the other side is, yes, we started the Moloy story. Yes, when we started, of course, in Lagos, then I don't know now, the rent was not something that a starter could afford and we just went to lagos without knowing anybody to support you so we're struggling squatting with friends here and there then wow. 
as I told you, I was able to get a friend who was a, 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 a just a sergeant in the military, and he was staying in Ojo Barracks. So, and he was the closest relative I had, and I had to stay with them. But there was this strict rule going into the barracks that by, I think there's a time by by six. They, they close the gate or oh, that's when they get opened so when you come you have to queue so we had to queue by the time you get into the barracks it will be around 12. and when you get there you need to you need to you need to quickly take a nap and then by five again you need to go start heading to the office because you're in a bank you have to open shop seven o'clock then you have to so if it's raining that's how you suck your way <laughs> you yeah to the main road and then good mallways of those days you jump into a mallway mallway to mile two and then you catch another mallway to CMS and it was uh, as I said I was telling you the phone was catching the mallway once you are in it it's the the excitement is over but I think we enjoyed it and at the end of the day uh, it showed that it's not how you start but how you end and I think uh, a lot of us lot lot of young men will always tell you that. Uh, I have nothing how do i start it's 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 an excuse yeah. and as i always tell them that i'm not a i'm, I'm not an economist uh, but i knew i would never for, i will never forget the factors of production and i know my economics teacher always emphasized that entrepreneur is the most important capital comes second and it comes after the entrepreneur land after the entrepreneur even the wages the labor after the entrepreneur there are four factors right yeah, so, and, and all this, the most important is the entrepreneur, and the entrepreneur is you. And you is not you physically, it's the determination that you want to establish a business. That's what makes you an entrepreneur. Once that is there, all other factors should be taken for granted. Oh, wow. Wow. I mean, thank you so much, sir. Uh, because for a lot of us who have come from different areas of our lives, some of us went to school to study biology, I had the privilege of schooling in America, no parents, so it wasn't a thing of, of uh, excitement. But I want to thank you for sharing that journey story with us. It's very important for us to see how the projection works in creating enterprises that last. I mean, 20 years, and we look forward to you know taking your business to many more um, generations, not just the first, second, third. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much, and my pleasure. I, I would also want to know a little about your story so that we will will understand uh, uh, how you thought about this. I never thought that I can get a Nigerian coffee easily. <laughs> My son was always telling me that he, he, in fact, when we left just after the discussion, he was telling me that, look, Baba, Baba, I told you that coffee business can be a good business. <laughs> you remember? And that's when I remember. So how did you think about it? And, and what, what, what informed this? Day? Thank you. Um, thank you so much, sir. I remember the first, my first experience about coffee obviously was in Nigeria, but in 21, 2001, I had the privilege of going to America for school and a friend had given me a book about Howard Schultz, who is the founder of Starbucks and Starbucks is the biggest coffee company in the world today. And I was just inspired how one man took coffee beans and transformed an entire culture. Currently, that business has over 30,000 stores across the world. So I just told myself, like, and now I think I was in year two then in America that if I ever started a business, it would be in coffee. I didn't know anything about Nigeria. I didn't know whether we grew coffee. But one of the things that I do also is I do a lot of research. I spend a lot of time researching. So in 20, 2009, I moved back to Nigeria on a one-way ticket. Um, I just graduated from school. Everybody thought I should have stayed, stayed back in America, but I said, I wanted to be part of the building, nation building process in our country. I felt like all of us couldn't stay back in America. Some of us have to come back home to support that process. So I took a one way ticket. I just graduated from school, no money. I had to borrow money for my ticket, but I was back in Lagos. So I started to search on whether or not to go into corporate Nigeria or starting my own business. On that journey, I think I spent a bit of time working with the company. And then I, I worked with the local government as a senior special assistant on private um, equity development. Those were one of the key things that began to inspire me. How do we begin to build a sustainable Nigeria? So in 2015, there was a call for African entrepreneurs to apply for a particular fund to start their business. So I told myself, maybe this is the time. So I applied that I wanted to start a coffee business. And like I said, I'd had that idea 
But before that time, I started studying and I found out that Nigeria had been growing coffee. But it, it used to baffle me why Nigerians didn't have access to that coffee. Because every time I go into a shop to get coffee, the coffee was imported into our country. So when I applied for the fund, I said I wanted to see, um, do a research whether Nigerians would want to drink Nigerian coffee. So on that journey, that's literally how I started my business. I applied for that fund. I got selected as the first 1,000 entrepreneurs across Africa that had ideas that could transform the continent. Um, I think it was the Tumili Meli Foundation. And I literally started my business. I remember starting that business. I didn't even have a company name when I was selected as the first. It was an idea. And they selected my idea. I started the business from there. And ever since, I've been growing my company using locally grown coffee from Taraba State. Good. Congratulations. You'll soon start using locally produced milk from Nigeria. <laughs> yeah, what a good uh, story. So I uh, wish you the best. You have all it takes to, to be better than Starbucks, I tell you. And I'm sure we'll, uh, you'll one day say that, yeah, we've had this conversation. And I'll be proud to say, yeah, I was part of <laughs> Prince's journey, at least. Um, so thank you for being around and it's a pleasure. So I'm always available for you, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, MD, sir, I would like to know what word would you like to share with a budding entrepreneur in Nigeria today? Yeah, just if you can think it, you can do it. I think that's just it. Thank you so much, sir. It's really a pleasure sparing your very, um, you know, I know you're a very busy man. I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to come into your world and inspiring young entrepreneurs to keep up on the journey. I want to thank you also, all our viewers, for listening. It's been a fantastic time. I've learned a lot. Um, I remember one statement he made yesterday. He said, we have a country and our country is our platform to be the best that we can be. Thank you once again. My name is Princess Adeyin Katekena and you have a lovely time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Journeys in Entrepreneurship. This interview was recorded on the 10th of July, 2021 at the LNZ Integrated Farms office in Abuja. We look forward to hearing about your haha -ha moments in the comment section below and invite you to join us next week Friday for a new episode.